morning stars they wet the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him when final breath he gave as heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness battle in the grave a war on death was waged the power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake the stone was rolled away his perfect love could not be overcome now death where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever He is raised. and welcome to our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus as the Amen. worship team comes. If you're a visitor with us this morning, it's wonderful to have you here. My name is Pastor Ben and I, we would love to have you fill out one of these connection cards that you would see in the pew in front of you and, and uh, it's just wonderful to be here together worshiping with the people of God. Let's, uh, let's pray and continue worshiping him this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the gift of, of an empty tomb, Lord. Thank you that, that Jesus is risen, and so today we come to worship and praise your name, Lord. Would you bless us with your presence today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. verses 1 through 12. 
Now on the first day of the week, it was very early in the morning. They and certain other women with them took their spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in and they did not see the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this. Behold, two men stood beside them and their clothing stood beside them and their clothing was bright and white. Then they were afraid and they bowed their faces to the earth. But the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. Do you not remember what he said in Galilee? He would be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He would be crucified, and on the third day, he would arise again. And they remembered what he had said. Then they returned from the tomb and told all those that were with them and the 11 others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. Yours is the victory. 
Let's pray this morning as the ushers prepare to come and receive the Lord's tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather as your people. Thank you for the ways that you speak to us. And, and Lord, today we proclaim that you are the one in, in whom we put our hope. We are grateful, Lord, for the, the empty tomb this morning. And thank you for the ways that... Uh, that Thank you for the ways that you, uh, you are active in our midst today. Lord, as the one who holds our hope, we, we do come to you with our needs as well today. You know the, the reasons that we need hope, Lord, and we lift those to you. We ask, Father, that as you know the cry of our hearts, would you, would you minister to those needs today? Some of us here, Lord, we, we come needing your, your healing, and, and maybe we need even a physical touch in our bodies today. And you're, you're the one who knit our bodies together, and so we lift those needs to you, and, and our hope is in you for those needs, <coughs> because you are the you are the God who has defeated death itself. You are the God who gives us a new body, the scripture says. Lord, at other times, what we need is reconciliation. We recognize the, the brokenness and the relationships in our life. We, we see our need for you, and we ask that, Lord, would you, would you bring that peace that is needed in our lives? Would you do the work that only you can do there? Lord, others of us have needs that you know, maybe we haven't needed, even admitted to ourselves or, or perhaps it's even too painful for us to put into words. And today we, we come and we lift those needs to you as well. And again, we proclaim our hope is in you. Our hope is in Jesus, the living one, the one who is risen. Thank you, Lord. And in this time, as we worship you, we, we come to the giving of our tithes and offerings. And, and, and Lord, this is our expression of worship to you. We love you, Lord. And so we want to be part of what you are doing in our world. And so we ask that as we receive this offering, would you bless it and use it for your kingdom and for your glory, Lord. And would you continue to speak to us this day as your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Reeling and trying to come to terms with everything that had happened the preceding Friday? How could they square the execution of Jesus with everything that Jesus had done and taught over the pe previous several years? They, they were trying to make sense of, of the world as it just kind of turned upside down on them in a matter of a couple of days. And then into that darkness of that room where they were gathered... Mary Magdalene and several others of the, the women who had been following Jesus all along burst in. The tomb is empty, they declared. And then they proceeded to tell what had to sound like the most unbelievable story of all times. It, it was a story involving angels that appeared to them and their, their clothes flashed like lightning and, and the angels said something about Jesus not being dead anymore. It was quite a story. I suspect that some of the disciples in that room, as, as Mary and the others said what had happened, I, I suspect some of them wanted to believe. They, they, wanted to, they wanted Jesus to be alive. But I also suspect that most of them were good historians. They knew that from the beginning of time, 
Dead means dead. I mean, that, that's the end. There, there's nothing that comes after dead. On, on our tombstones, we have the year we were born, we have the dash, and, and then we have the year that we die. And, and that, that's the end of the story. And they understood that. Death is the end. And I think that the disciple Thomas emerged as kind of the spokesman of the historian group of the, the disciples of Jesus Historical Society. He, he comes out and says, look, I, I want to believe Jesus is alive, but until the living Jesus is standing here in front of me and I put my fingers in the nail holes in his hands, I'm not going to believe it, Thomas says. Because, and I believe that right here there are a couple of things that speak to the, the historical veracity, that the truth of the account of Jesus rising from the dead. So, sometimes we'll have people that, that will claim, well, that the story of Jesus rising from the dead was fabricated by, by the disciples and that Jesus' followers had, had made up the story. And I, I'm still kind of unclear on what the motivation would be. If it was a get-rich scheme, it was about the most idiotic one ever because most of them went on to become martyrs. And, and so, but people will still claim that, but there are, Two things right here at the very beginning of the story of Jesus' resurrection that really, I, I think, speak to the truth of the account, things that nobody would make up. And the first is that if, a, if we were in the first century and we wanted to start this conspiracy about somebody rising from the dead, nobody in the first century would have fabricated that story and made... The, the women, the primary witnesses to that account. And that, that just wouldn't have happened. And, and that's a historical difference between our time and the first century. You see, in, in, in our time, if, if there's a, a woman who witnesses a crime or sees something, something extraordinary, and, and we put a woman in front of a jury and she gives a testimony, her, her, her testimony is just as valid as if somebody has a Y chromosome and they're given the same testimony. We, see, the, the sex really doesn't matter in, in our time for a person's truth. But in the first century, they didn't really see women as reliable, especially when talking about things like people rising from the dead. I mean, that, that's kind of unbelievable to begin with. And, and nobody in the first century would have told that story and made a, a woman the primary witness if that's not how it happened, it, that, because it wasn't believable. And we, we see that in the disciples' response. As Mary Magdalene, who's followed Jesus from the beginning, comes in and says, the tomb is empty, Jesus is alive. So, yeah, Mary, okay. See, the, the, the disciples aren't buying it. And that's the, that's the second thing that really speaks to the truth, I, I believe, is that you know, the, supposedly the ones who would make up the story of Jesus rising from the dead they're the doubters in the story. The disciples aren't believing it. They, they don't believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, they eventually come around as Jesus appears to them and Jesus reveals himself. But at the beginning, they're not the believers. And nobody would make that up. But the fact that remained was gnawing at the disciples. It's the same question that, that would be gnawing at everybody in the, in the weeks to follow. And the question was, once Peter went and he saw, yeah, the tomb's empty, the question is, what do we do with the empty tomb? What do we do with an empty tomb? And, and what does that mean? And I, I think that was something they were trying to figure out that morning. And as the morning went on, I, I think a couple of them just said, no, we, we got to get out of town, and, and we just need to clear our heads. And so they, they take off to a village, and that's where I want to pick up in the scripture this morning. It's in Luke chapter 24. I want to talk, starting in verse 13. The scripture says, and behold, on that very day, that's the first day of the week, Easter Sunday morning, day of the resurrection, on that very day, two of them, Two of the disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, which was 60 stadia from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they came to a stop, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you possibly 
the only one living near Jerusalem who does not know about the things that have happened here in these days. And he said to them, what sort of things? And they said to him, those about Jesus the Nazarene who proved to be a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people and how the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified. But we, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. But also some women amongst us left us early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And so some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. So two disciples are there walking along the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And as they walked, they couldn't help but talk about Jesus. And they were talking to one another, and I suspect it was their whole experience with Jesus as they were talking about when each of them met Jesus and what they thought about him and the great things that they had seen Jesus do. And then the previous week, how he had entered Jerusalem riding on the donkey, and the people had cried out, Hosanna, and they were calling for God's salvation. They were praising Jesus, and then how he would teach in the temple, and and then that, that strange Passover night where, where he took the bread and he broke and said, this is my body which is for you. And, and he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood and it's his sins that her, his blood poured out for our sins. And, and they were talking about that. Well, I don't know what Jesus was meaning, but then they had to also say, well, it kind of seems pointless now because Jesus is dead. He's, he's crucified. And he's in... Well, he's not in the tomb, but we don't know where he is. And as they were walking along, they would have been sharing their thoughts and their opinions, maybe even their disagreements. And as they were immersed in their conversation, Jesus kind of shows up and starts walking with them. And, and then he's that annoying traveler that we bump into sometimes, just kind of butts their way into your conversation. Have, have you met that person? Or you're, you're just walking along, maybe you're, you're at the store talking with a friend, or, or you're walking down Main Street or something, you, you're just in your world with the person that you're with, and then somebody else just comes along and decides they're part of the conversation. And that's kind of what happens. They, they're, they're walking along, and then Jesus shows up. It's like, what you talking about? Where are you going? It's like, well, who asked you? Has Jesus ever shown up in your life? unexpectedly. You know, we, we walk through life, we're on our road to Emmaus or wherever it is that we've decided that we needed to go, and, and Jesus has this way of appearing out of nowhere, and he tends to come with annoying questions, and he, and he comes, it's like, well, where, where are you going? What you doing? For those of us who are followers of Jesus, sometimes we just find ourselves in situations we have no idea how we got there or why we're there, but we have the sense that Jesus has he's been with us the whole time and that he's been sustaining us and directing us. I, I think people who don't follow Jesus also have that experience, even if we don't believe in God. Sometimes what happens is we, we look at our life and we recognize that, no, we're, I just don't recognize. I don't understand how I got in this situation. My life is all over the place. It's chaotic and it's not what it's supposed to be. But, but somehow even in the midst of that, we can sense something in our spirit that, that says, I, I, I'm not alone. There's, there's somebody, something is, is with me here. And, and we might not know any other word to call it other than something divine or, 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 or God. And I think that's the spirit of Jesus walking with us. Jesus meets us on the road. And he comes with those annoying questions of, where are you going? What, what direction are, are you heading? Where, where are you going? What's been going on here? Sometimes we're not too excited to answer that one. We're not too excited to tell Jesus what's been going on because maybe we know that life isn't working out the way that I planned it to work out. 
and things aren't going the way that I, I know they should be going. And, and so maybe to tell Jesus what's been going on is to tell about our, our failures and, and things that aren't as we want them to be. No, I, I think we all go through those times. In my time as a pastor, I've had dark days where it felt like I was walking the road alone. Not sure what to do or where to turn. And then somehow, out of nowhere, Jesus, the living one, shows up on the journey. And he says, I'm here. He says, I'm with you. You see, we don't walk the road alone. The empty tomb proclaims something to us. It it tells us of a reality that's not really a secret. It's that Jesus, the living one, he's not in the tomb anymore. He's walking with us. We cannot escape the love and the presence of Jesus. He's the God who is always reaching out to us. But of course, we, it's all, sometimes it's pretty difficult for us to see that. And sometimes the difficulty arises out of our crushed hope. See, crushed hope has this way of obscuring our vision of Jesus. And I think we can see that in Cleopas. As, as Jesus shows up and he says, what's been going on here? You can kind of hear Cleopas's depression. In verse 21, he says, we were hoping, we were hoping that this Jesus, the Nazarene, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. But of course, Jesus is dead. And dead means dead. It's the end. And Cleopas proceeded to tell about how the women had gone to the tomb and They'd come back with the story that Jesus is alive, but still nobody is able to find Jesus. And then Jesus responds in verse 25. Scripture says, And then he said to them, You foolish men. And I I love that. No, the the women have believed from the beginning that the tomb was empty, that Jesus is alive. They go tell the story, and and it's, it's, it's... Guys, we can be kind of dense sometimes. I think Jesus picks up on that. You foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ, for the Messiah, to suffer these things and to come into his glory? And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in the scriptures. Cleopas, begun with his crushed hope. We were hoping that it was he who would redeem Israel. We had hoped, but now he's gone. He's crucified, dead, and buried. The end. And then Jesus comes along. And one of the things I love about Jesus is how he's a person just, just like we are. And just like any personality, it's kind of hard to predict what people will do sometimes. When I imagine Jesus, it's just my imagination, I imagine Jesus coming to his depressed disciple here and putting his hand on his back and coddling him, saying, it's, it's going to be okay, Cleopas. That, that's, that's how I would like to imagine Jesus. That's not how Luke tells the story. The way Luke tells the story here is, there, there's Cleopas there, saying, we were hoping that it was going to be Jesus who would redeem Israel. And Jesus His response is, you dummies, you morons, this was supposed to happen from the beginning is basically what Jesus says, that from the beginning God had planned that this is how he would bring his salvation, this is how God's deliverer, the Messiah, this was the job description from the beginning, and what follows after that point, it has to be the most amazing Easter sermon of all time, as Cleopas and the other disciple listen to Jesus as he goes through the Old Testament and explains everything that the scripture had said about him. Everything that was pointing towards what Jesus had just accomplished. Now Luke doesn't go into details about what, uh, what scripture specifically Jesus talked about, but it says he started with Moses and, and went through the prophets. And in the Old Testament, the first book of Moses was, was called the book of Genesis. And so I think that's probably where Jesus started. He must have started with 
Genesis 1, God made a good creation. He, he made a world that, that was designed to thrive and it was a marvelous creation and he installed humanity there as guardians of it. We were to care for it and, and to work it and, and to produce it. And, and that, that's the story of Genesis 1 and 2 there. As Adam and Eve are there in the garden, humanity is there doing its thing as God designed us to do it. But then humanity did there what it does so well today. We, we have a way of rebelling against God and we, we abuse the goodness of his creation. And so that, that's what happens in Genesis 3 where we messed up. And the goodness that God had imbued into creation was corrupted. But right there, God made a choice. God loved his creation. And God said that, that he was going to redeem it. And he was going to redeem us. He was going to redeem humanity. But the way he chose to do it, because he, he didn't want to just erase everything he had made, the, the way God chose to do it was to redeem humanity from the inside out. He was going to become one of us and redeem us from within. And to do that, he chose a family. He chose the family of Abraham. And he had a promise to Abraham, a promise that pointed forward to Jesus. He told Abraham, through you, all the nations will be blessed. And Jesus, I think, picks up on that. Jesus says, no, I, when I'm lifted up on the cross, will draw all men to myself. Jesus is the one through whom all the nations enter into the blessing of God. After Abraham, his family ends up in in slavery and in Exodus and, and God leads them out with Moses and Moses brings Israel out it's at the time of Passover that Jews today continue to celebrate that God led them out of slavery and formed them into a people well, of course that people did just about as well as humanity in the garden just as about as well as you and I do it listening to God they, they also rebelled and they weren't they weren't bringing the blessing to the nations that God called Israel to be. And from there, I think Jesus, he saw the need for us to understand who he is. And so he began to talk about the prophets. And the prophets pointed forward to this deliverer that God was going to send not only for Israel, but for the whole world. And I think as Jesus talked to the disciples that, that Sunday morning, maybe it was afternoon by now, I think he would have gone to places like Isaiah 53 and he would have talked about verses that they knew from the beginning, verses that they thought was about them as, as the people of God, as, as Israel. But in Isaiah 53, Jesus would have, I think, pointed at that and said about God's servant, the, the servant that Isaiah was talking about, the servant was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid on him and by his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. See, up to this point, nobody in the history of reading Isaiah would have thought that that was talking about the Messiah. But, but now, after the resurrection, Jesus comes to these two disciples, and I think he points back to passages like that and says, look, from the beginning, God's Messiah, God's deliverer that he was going to send us was to die for our sins. That the wrongdoings of us would be placed on God's deliverer. That he would be the one who was pierced for our sins. But Jesus would also talk about how death doesn't have to be the end anymore. And he would have gone to places like Psalms. And in Psalm 16, again, one of God's servants is being talked about there. And the psalmist says that, that God will not abandon the, abandon the soul of his servant to Sheol, to the grave. God says, you will not let your Holy One undergo decay. You will make known to me the way of life. See, the psalmist had talked about that centuries before. And I think Jesus had to make those connections for them. That just, just as Jesus died on the cross, the psalmist had already talked about centuries before that God's Holy One would not undergo decay. Wouldn't, God, Jesus wouldn't deteriorate in the tomb, but God would show us the way of life. And Jesus is the Holy One. Jesus is, in fact, even in the Gospel of Mark, even the demons confess that Jesus is the Holy One of God. And now here he is, risen from the dead, saying, Look, death doesn't have to be the end anymore.
I think it would have gone to places like Jeremiah 31, where Jeremiah had promised God's people that there would be a, a new covenant, there would be a new way that God's people could enter into a relationship with him that, that wasn't dictated by laws and regulations, but God's law would be written on our heart and we would have a relationship with him. I think Jesus must have pointed them back to what had happened the previous Thursday where Jesus had broken the bread and he'd offered the cup and said, this is the new covenant. This is the new thing that God is doing. And then just like the first covenant, the first agreement God had with Israel, that, that rested on God calling his people Israel out of Egypt. It rested on the Exodus. I think Jesus, as he talked about Passover and the whole Exodus story, and now he's talking to his two disciples, I, I, I think he must have, picked up the Exodus language that we also have in the prophets where Jeremiah and Isaiah would, would call to God's people, come out, come out of Babylon, come out of the places where you are isolated from God and come to the Lord. And Jesus was, you know, he was giving us that call all along, calling us out of sin. For the past several weeks, I've been preaching on different sins that separate us from God. We've been talking about sins of our, our character. And the long and the short of it is that we all have a pride problem. See, we're, we're all kind of like Adam in the garden, where we think we know better than God. God's given us our boundaries. He, he's given us guidelines that will keep us safe and help us thrive. But just like Adam in the garden... We choose that, well, th those don't really have to apply to me, right? And I, I don't really have to obey everything God tells me, right? I, I, I know better. You see, we, we get to a point where we think we know better than God. I wonder if we don't see that in the fact that two of Jesus' disciples are leaving Jerusalem and heading off somewhere else. Perhaps Cleopas and his his friend who had left the other disciples in Jerusalem, perhaps they were saying, well, yeah, we have this marvelous story about Jesus not being dead anymore, but we know dead means dead. And that, that, that has to be the end, right? Perhaps they know better than what Mary and the others have said. Perhaps they know better. And here comes Jesus walking along with them. See, in our pride, we think we know better. And what happens is we sin and we rebel against what God has told us to do or what he's told us not to do. And when we rebel, and each and every one of us have done that, we have all sinned against God. There are no exceptions there. And the punishment for sin is death. And it brings me back to the question of what do we do with an empty tomb. If the punishment for sin is death and Jesus died for our sins, what do we do with an empty tomb? And what does that mean? And even if Jesus rose from the dead, let's just give that for the sake of argument today. And I believe that happened. I, I believe he did rise from the dead. But for the sake of argument, let's say Jesus rose from the dead. Why, why does that matter to you and me? Why, why would Jesus, why would one man rising from the dead why is that reason that we would have hope? And I think the answer to that question is, is really important. And one of the things we have to understand is that we as humanity, we, we have representatives that really set the pattern for our lives. And in the scripture, Adam is one pattern for us to follow. That's one way of life. That's one of our representatives is Adam. Jesus is another. He sets a new pattern for our life. He, he's what Paul says is the second Adam. Jesus is Adam as he should have been from the beginning. Jesus is the faithful son who is doing what God, his father, told him to do. Jesus is Israel as it should have been, fully obedient to God and to, to God's law. And so Jesus is another representative. He is another way of life that we can follow. And, and Paul, in the book of Romans, begins to explain this a little bit in Romans 5 and 6. 
as he talks about these different patterns for our life, these different representatives, this is what Paul says in, in Romans 5. He says, For as through one man, through Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one, through the obedience of Jesus, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the offense would increase. But where sin increased, grace, the gift of God, that, that grace is God's gift for us that, that we can enjoy life with him, that we can share in the victory of Jesus. And what Paul says is where sin increased, the grace of God increased and abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, so also grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin so that grace may increase? Far from it. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. What Paul is saying there is that, that as we follow the pattern of Jesus and we unite with Jesus, and that's what we symbolize in baptism. In baptism, a person is buried with Jesus and to be, to be submersed in the waters is a symbolic way of saying we are dying to our old self. We have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer us who lives, but Christ who lives in us. And so just like Jesus was put in the tomb, we are buried in the waters of baptism. But just like Jesus, we don't stay in the tomb very long. See, Jesus was put in the tomb on the third day. He comes out again. And just as we unite with Jesus in burial, in, the resur in baptism, we also rise to walk in newness of life with him because Jesus shares his victory with us. And that's why in Romans 8, Paul goes on to say, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, there's no condemnation because as we unite with Jesus in his death, we are also united with him in his resurrection. As we die with Jesus, we also rise to the new life that he has for us. And he leads us into that new life. I think Jesus had to be explaining all of this to the disciples that, that morning as they, they were walking to Emmaus. Because they didn't understand why Jesus would have to go to the cross. They didn't understand what Jesus was doing. And I want to pick up as that story concludes. As they arrive in Emmaus in Luke 24. I'll start reading again in verse 28. It says, And they approached the village where they were going, and he gave the impression that he was going further. And so they strongly urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And it came about when he had reclined at the table with them, and took the bread and blessed it, and he broke it, and he began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were our hearts not burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen. The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And they began, the, the two had gone to Emmaus, began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. So Jesus and the two disciples, they arrive in the town where they were going and they find themselves at the dinner table. And Jesus blesses the meal and begins to break the bread and hand it to his disciples. And there was something in that moment that where it, it just clicked for them. They recognized that this is Jesus. He, he's not in the tomb. Jesus is alive. And they, they recognize Jesus and they believe. There's something about it. Maybe, they, maybe their minds went back to that previous Thursday. Where again, Jesus had broken the bread and he'd offered it to his disciples. He'd sent the cup around, said, this is the new covenant. And he'd said, do this in remembrance of me. And there as they broke the bread, they remembered and they recognized that Jesus, the living one, was now offering them 
the bread of life. And they believed. And they went back to Jerusalem. And Jesus had appeared to others in Jerusalem. And, and the disciples were beginning to believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. They, they'd seen him. And as they believed, I think it's easy for us to kind of put the disciples on the pedestal. And, and we, we see, we see the, like the faith of the disciples. And well, they, they must have had it all figured out. And that's not really how it was. See, their faith was like your faith and my faith, which really isn't the absence of questions. Sometimes that's what we want faith to be. Sometimes we want faith to mean that I have all the answers, I have this figured out. We want the answers to our questions, but that's that's not really what faith is. That's knowledge, that's not faith. Faith is not a lack of questions Faith is living in the story that these apostles have transmitted to us. The tomb is empty. Now what do we do with that? The tomb is empty. How do we respond to that? I think there are two ways, or maybe probably a lot of ways to respond, but there are two main categories of how we can respond. The first is, denial and that's frankly what most people will do most of us are good enough historians to say yeah the story of somebody rising from the dead this i'm just not buying it and and we can deny it We, we can deny the resurrection of jesus all day long that's an option that he has left open to us but one day each and every one of us paul says will stand before the judgment seat of christ because he is risen from the dead and he is lord and he is king And we will all stand before Jesus one day. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We'll all meet Jesus one day. The risen from the, see, the the Jesus who went to the cross, we'll meet that Jesus. (coughs) But he's the risen from the dead Jesus as well. He's the Lord of all. We will stand before him one day. And we can deny it, but one day that that option will be removed and we're going to be face-to-face with Jesus, whether we like it or not. The other way we can respond to the empty tomb is to enter the faith, to, to begin living the story that Christ is risen, that he calls us to new life. See, faith is joining the Lord of life at the table and recognizing and worshiping Jesus as Lord. And when we do that, what we find is that Jesus shares his victory with us. And we all want that victory. We all sense how we can be held captive by our own characters, by our own sins. And we've been talking about that over the past month and a half, where we've been talking about these sins in our characters that hold us captive. We, we talked about lust and how, how that just reduces everyone in our life, even those that we love, that it reduces them to objects and really robs us of the ability to love and who God has called us to be. We've talked about envy and how envy holds us captive by forcing us to into that comparison game where I'm constantly having to compare myself to others and I, I want to be better than those, but I, I just can't be. Envy will hold us captive there. We've talked about vainglory and, and how it, it forces us to put on a show for people and sloth and it holds us back from the goodness that God has for us. We've talked about greed and how as we accumulate more and more and more what we find is we're unable to fill the whole of Jesus in our lives with and the finite things can't fill the hole in our life for the creator God and we've talked about anger and how it just kind of blows up on us all over the place and these sins can hold us captive but Jesus has conquered sin and Jesus shares that victory with us and that's what the empty tomb means is that as he has conquered sin he, he died to sin Sin is done for Jesus, and he rose again for a new life, and and that's the new life that he shares with us. It's a life where he calls us out of sin and into freedom. Do we want to be free? Jesus calls us to freedom. He is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. And that Jesus is coming back. As we wait for that coming, we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus.
We celebrate it in the way he told us to celebrate it, in the breaking of the bread and the receiving of the juice. Because in this, we remember the resurrection. In a few moments, we'll have the opportunity to receive communion today. It's a time where we, we take the bread and we take the juice. And we do this because the scripture says, as we receive the bread and the juice, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And what Paul says there is important for us to hear. We proclaim the death of Jesus. We proclaim that Jesus died on the cross. We proclaim that until he comes. The, the one who died is coming back. We, we proclaim the, the death of Jesus But we also, in that proclamation, we say death isn't the end of the story. Jesus has risen and he's coming back. And we we proclaim the death of Jesus until he comes. And that coming is a reminder that the story isn't over. Death isn't the end anymore. The tomb has been defeated. Death isn't the end. So what do we do with an empty tomb? we enter into the story that it proclaims. The story that Christians have proclaimed for centuries, Christ is dead, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. This morning we have the opportunity to receive the bread and the juice, and and these are our symbols of Jesus. The bread is a symbol of the body of Jesus that was broken for us. Like Isaiah said, by his wounds we are healed. And, and the juice is a, is a symbol of the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us for our new life with God. We come this morning to receive from the Lord. And we recognize that because of his victory, this king is... This God is worthy. He's worthy of our love, of our worship, of our fidelity. See, if Jesus accomplished everything that we're talking about this morning, he's a God who is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of everything we have, and he's king. He's king of, what Revelation says, king of all nations, tribes, languages. Jesus is king of all. And we come to receive from him this morning. And so I'm going to pray in a moment. And if you're a believer in Jesus, if, if you believe in the story, you're invited to the Lord's table to receive from him. Maybe today some of us hear the first time hearing, either hearing the story or the first time that maybe the words of the story are ringing true in our heart. And we haven't put our faith in Jesus before now. And today is a good day to enter into the story of the empty tomb and say, I want to be part of the story that God is, is writing. And life will never be the same because Jesus leads us into his freedom. And if that's where you are this morning, I invite you to pray with me in a moment and then come and receive from the Lord today. Let's pray as, as our musicians come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of an empty tomb. And today, Lord, whether we come to you for a first time, whether we've believed in you for decades, Lord, we come together as your one people. And we confess that We have sinned. And see, in our pride, we thought we knew better. And we confess our sin and that we haven't been who you've called us to be. And Jesus, we believe that you died on the cross for our sins and we ask that you and in your mercy would forgive us. And would you make us new this day, Lord? But our faith isn't only in the cross. Our faith is in the story of your apostles, that the tomb is empty, that death isn't the end anymore, and that we have new life in you. And so, Lord, we proclaim that you are worthy of all that we have to offer. As we come to you today, forgiven and redeemed and made new, we come to your table 
And we ask that this bread and juice would be for us the body and blood of Jesus. And would you bless us in this time with your presence, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're invited to come to the table. I will give you the the bread and the juice, and then we can all return to our seats, and we'll eat and drink together once everyone has been served. So come as you are ready. Spirit move among us. He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does.
in the same passage where the scripture says we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the Apostle Paul says, for I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you. That story of the apostles. That the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please stand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning together. Thank you for the the gift of your Son, Lord, who not only died for us, but rose again so that we can be right with you. We can be in a right relationship with you, Lord. And today, as we receive Jesus into our lives and into our bodies, we are grateful for the gift of life with you. Would you bless us as we go from here and lead us as your people and form us into that people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. You are dismissed.